Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Mastery Podcast, where we help you optimize your human experience through holistic personal development, mind, body, spirit, with business as your vessel for freedom, fulfillment, and the impact of your life's work. Today, I have Justin Welsh, who over the last decade has helped build two $50 million annual recurring revenue companies, teams of 150 plus people, and has raised over 300 million in venture capital. That was until he burned out. He saw the opportunity in the attention economy. He started his one person business, and now he advises early stage SMB SaaS companies in the healthcare technology vertical. He runs a private community for online creators. He's built two digital products for creators, and he has a one-on-one -on -one coaching business. In this episode, we talked about how LinkedIn is not a resume site. It is the land of opportunity for creators, the best route to take as a beginner in online business, and we broke down the components of a one-person business content strategy and the trial and error in between. If you are a growth-minded individual that has skills, interests, or passions, have tried to turn them into a source of income but struggle to make it sustainable and predictable, consider joining Modern Mastery HQ where you can copy and paste our hundreds of processes, strategies, and systems into your one-person business while working four hours or less per day. We've packaged up the information from myself, a marketing consultant, and Joey, a performance consultant, into proven processes for starting and growing your business as a coach, freelancer, digital product creator, content creator, or online educator while becoming a laser-focused machine. We offer a seemingly outrageous $50,000 guarantee because we are that confident in our teachings. If you want to build a one-person business, design your perfect lifestyle, and live like you are supposed to, go to join.modernmastery.co slash podcast to get your first month for $5. Or if you want to skip all of the do-it-yourself stuff and join an intensive six-month program that guarantees business and personal success, we also have the Mastery Program. You can apply for the next cohort at join.modernmastery.co slash program. Links to both of those will be in the show notes. And last but not least, I have a few favors to ask that cost a whopping zero dollars. So if you enjoyed this podcast, subscribe or follow. It's one button click away and it helps support the growth of this podcast. Two, leave a rating letting us know what you thought. Three, you can tag us at Modern Mastery on Twitter or at Modern Mastery HQ on Instagram with a link to this episode and some kind words or just some kind words. It always helps. And if you do all three, send us a DM and we have something special for you in return. So without further ado, let's dive right into this episode of the Modern Mastery podcast. Justin Welsh, my man, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dan. So uh, it's really good to be here, man. Glad glad that you and I are getting a chance to, to catch up and chat with one another. Yeah, I'm excited. You, you do something very unique. I mean, I'm a Twitter guy, kind of exploring Instagram now. And as you said, before we even started this, a lot of Twitter people like to shit on LinkedIn. And I was one of those people because I used to think of it as like, oh, this is for recruiting for a job or trying to find jobs. And other things of that nature, which we will dive into. But I have a question that I ask everyone that comes on this podcast. It's the very first question. And that question is, what is your life philosophy in one sentence? In one sentence, um, to do what I want with whom I want, whenever I want. That is my life philosophy. You're on it. That it's, it's, it goes both ways. It's like people either know or they think about it and then it comes out to something similar. It, it's all it's all related to growth. Like I, I can kind of sense what everyone's going after now, especially with the people that have seen uh, some form of success or autonomy or have gained that personal sovereignty that everyone's after. And that's really it. So with that, how how did you make that realization? 
Yeah, I, I made that realization through um, kind of going through this painful journey, which was um, for those of folks who aren't familiar with me, my, my past life is I'm an executive operator. I was chief revenue officer at a SaaS company. Uh, prior to that, I worked for another SaaS company that was a unicorn for five years. I was an early employee there. And after 10 years in really high growth SaaS companies, ZocDoc and PatientPop, I came crashing down, bur burned out really badly, especially the executive part. When I took my first executive role, I was 33. I was a stretch hire, thought I'd get the company to a million, maybe two, got it to about 51 million. And as it got bigger and bigger and bigger, I lost control. And burnout is about loss of control. It's not about working hard. I could work hard all day, but losing control is, is what starts to really cause burnout. And in late 2018, December, um, I was really heavy, was drinking too much, eating too much, not getting enough sleep, and I had a panic attack. And um, I literally thought I was dying, like no joke. My wife had to call the EMTs, 911, they all came to the house. Um, it was really, really bad. And uh, after that happened, that January, about maybe two weeks later, I let my co-CEOs know that I would be stepping down from my role, and I stayed for another eight months. Uh, got myself into shape, uh, stopped drinking so heavily, slept more. But but that was the sort of the thing that needed to happen in order for me to look at my life through a different lens, if that makes sense. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. And I can't I can't resonate with the whole executive position. But in terms of <laughs> in terms of like alcohol and bad habits that stack up over time. That is one thing that I can heavily resonate with right now because I'm a I'm a young guy and I went to college. I had my time partying, partying and I made this realization recently where I was trying to justify my alcohol consumption and it, it was not a lot by any means, right? It was maybe once every two weeks just on the weekend and man, when... I say just like stopping that alone, it does give you more of that sense of control because like the brain fog and other things can last like up to a week and you're just not making the progress that you could. So in terms of regaining control, was did you do anything before leaving the job to start on that path? Yeah, I, I for 90 days I went alcohol free. Um, that was That was a huge thing for me to kind of reset my balance and less, less because like I like to chug alcohol, right. But more, <laughs> more, more because it was a coping mechanism for the stress that I felt, uh, at my job. And so I thought, I thought, all right, I've already made the decision to leave the company. I had great, great CEOs at, at my last business and still, still really close to them t today. So I made this decision to like clear my head, which then ultimately allowed me to eat better. I eat better when I'm not drinking alcohol, right? Make better food choices, sleep better, right? Naturally sleep, not in the beginning, but it starts to come, you know, much better, much cleaner. And then one thing that I did, I have two back surgeries. Um, so I can't do a whole lot of lifting or running. Those are kind of all off the table for me. So my wife and I started walking 10 miles a day. So we lived in LA at the time and the square around our house was 1.1 miles. And so we did three in the morning, three after lunch and three after dinner. And with no alcohol, healthy food, a lot of sleep and walking 10 miles a day, I lost like 40 pounds and I just got clear. And it was a perfect time for me to get clear because I was going out on my own and I needed to be as clear as possible. Yeah. <laughs> I read that in one of your tweets and I, I was going to save that for later because I am also a fellow walk enjoyer. I go on like five, six walks a day. They're not that long. Um, but you mentioned that you like a business idea popped into your head and we don't have to mm -hmm. dive into this business idea, Sure. but in terms of walking, would you now consider that crucial, not in terms of your health, but in terms of like idea generation and just being able to perform well during your business doings. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's interesting, much like eating and drinking, I'm a binary person. So like I'm right. usually zero or one, like, and with work, I'm not too much, not too different. So mm -hmm. if you sit me in front of the computer, I will sit in front of the computer all day and I will be on Twitter, be on LinkedIn, writing blog posts, fixing my website, 
changing processes, doing anything that I can do. I feel like every moment of the day where I'm not working on my business is a wasted moment, which is a problem. And so um, walking gets me away from that. And so we do phoneless walks. My, my wife and I, are, mm. she, she'll take hers because she's not uh, loving technology the same way that I do. Uh, and to me, it's just like clear time, right? It's clear time with my wife, which is awesome. Um, it's really good time for me to think. And when I walk a lot of times, I throw all the things that I'm struggling with out into the space for my wife to hear. And she's like really good at bringing a complete, we're very different people, bringing a very different approach uh, to solving those challenges. And like a lot of times when I get back home, I have, a, I have a problem solved, or at least I'm moving in the right direction. And therefore, when I get back on the computer or start working on the business again, I, I'm, I'm, I have much more clarity on solving that problem. So yeah, walks to me, extremely important. Yeah, that's awesome. So when you are on the walk, do you have, how to put this, like a specific mindful process that you go through? I'll give, I'll give you an example. So um, like I try to be as present as possible, like breathing, not focusing too much on the business stuff. And that can get kind of difficult, right? So is there like a conscious practice that you have to keep your mind off of the business stuff? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I don't know that it's a conscious practice that I have. But if I think about our walks together, they generally follow a pretty similar pattern to one another, which is usually it's time my wife likes to tell me a lot about her business as well. And you, you might find this, this might resonate with you or, or maybe it won't. But when she tells me about her business challenges, the, the answers become really obvious to me. And I'm like, oh, that's really simple. I would fix it this way, one, two, and three. And then I realize after after going through that, that her problem isn't too dissimilar from one that I'm facing, but I overcomplicate my own solutions rather than being simplistic in nature like I am when thinking through her solutions. So once I've actually helped her solve a problem, I'm like, oh, that applies to my problem as well. And therefore it's like two birds, one stone, which has been really, really helpful. Um, so our walks kind of start off <laughs> talking about her business and they generally morph into chatting about my business. Outside of that, we talk a lot about travel, right? So like 30, we, we, we walk about 90 minutes. I'd say 45 minutes of that walk is just like, where do we want to go next? Why do we want to go there? What do we want to discover? So it's quasi work and quasi play, but, but it's definitely a, a great opportunity for me to get my eyes off the computer. Right. I can, I resonate with that a lot. And I'm going to start making that like connection myself because I don't make that connection when I'm actually talking to people or giving advice because I read a tweet or some piece of content at some point where it's like, I am great at marketing other people's business. But when it comes to marketing my own business, I suck because you just overthink it too much. You overcomplicate what's actually going into it. But then if someone comes to you with advice, it's like, oh yeah, easy, this, this, and this. And so it's a, it's a cool thing to make that connection. But now I want to talk about how you balance that because a lot of people will hear this i'm assuming and they'll think 90 minute walks like that's a long time to be away from the computer and away from work mm -hmm. so first let's start with what does your daily schedule overall look like yeah it's it's pretty similar every day which like there's proponents for randomness and there's proponents for like you know structure i'm probably i lean more towards the structural side and so my days are pretty, pretty simple. Uh, I get up at about six o'clock and drink coffee. It's my favorite time of the day with my wife is we spend an hour and 15 minutes drinking coffee, talking to each other, catching up. We have a nice outdoor patio and, and it's screened in patio that we, we love to sit on. Um, 715 is when I post content each morning, uh, on LinkedIn, which is the platform that a lot of people probably have seen me on. I'm, I'm, pretty new to Twitter, although figuring it out and enjoying it a lot. Um, but I post on LinkedIn at 7.15 in the morning, central time. And I, I set aside 45 minutes for engagement to chat with people, answer comments, so on and so forth. Uh, at the end of that, we'll do one of two things. We'll, we'll get ready and we'll go for a walk. We do six miles here at a local park called Shelby Park. Uh, or we go to our gym in East Nashville here and we spend usually 60 minutes on, I'll do the elliptical machine because my back. Um, come home. Uh, generally I will write for about an hour and a half. So I try and write an hour and a half every single day, have lunch. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, my after 
afternoons are reserved for my advising clients. I advise early stage SMB SaaS companies. And so I usually have some meetings with, with customers Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Outside of that, Monday and Friday, I'm working on business systems. So I'm trying to, you know, eliminate, automate, delegate. Pretty, pretty simple. Following that that pattern, trying to understand what's taking a lot of my time that I don't like doing and that doesn't give me energy. I'm trying to do more things that do give me energy. That's a pretty like overarching look at my week. Nice. I, I like the the last summary of that. Doing things that give you more em- energy and taking away the things that don't. So, because that's a that's a big thing of mine too, and. I'm going to try that because recently I've noticed, and I'm talking about like early in the morning where you kind of take it easy. You, you have that hour where it's like you have your coffee, you possibly get warmed up for the day. Like you get ready Mm -hmm. to go. And I've been the type of guy where it's like, I just have to go in the morning and, and not that I want to, but it's like, I get up at five 36 and it's like, okay, we need to get the day started right now. Mm. And my mind isn't primed for that at all. I've noticed that I'll sit there for an hour doing practically nothing, just scrolling social media on my computer. And then it's like, okay, now it's time to write or post content or something when that could probably be better used, just relaxing, prepping my mind for the day and like warming up in a sense. Is that, has that been a like trial and error for you? Yeah. And and I actually, it's interesting because I chose that schedule just based on sort of just what I've done historically, right? Like old habits are, are hard to break. Um, but I chatted with my wife the other day about this. And when I'm drinking coffee in the morning, I'm generally at my highest point. I'm like, I can think most clearly. It Towards 2 p.m., I'm I'm almost worthless. Um, so you're, you're catching me two hours, two hours before I'm generally worthless. But um, <laughs> what I would like to do, I think, and test out and work towards is starting to flip that a little bit. So getting up coffee, instead of going right to the gym, um, writing, and then mm. coming to the gym two, three in the afternoon, you know, when I have some, when I'm a little down on energy and kind of getting ramped back up through through doing, you know, some workouts. So I'd like to actually test that and see how the quality of my day goes, the quality of my content, what I write, how my business reacts. Um, that That for me is the next sort of test to see if that makes a difference. Yeah. That's the beauty of all of this, right? Because I've been doing the same thing. It's like I've probably I've probably been self-employed. I think it's like closing in very close to three years now. And the entire time, it's just constant testing of like, okay, what's the perfect schedule for optimizing my energy throughout the day? And so with that, that's just a perk of self-employment and being able to create your own structure. So with that, you are the LinkedIn guy, even on Twitter, you're the LinkedIn guy. So let's, let's start there. Actually, let's start before that, before LinkedIn. So we're at the point where you have quit your executive position. And now before LinkedIn, was there anything you tried out? Was there any shiny object syndrome or testing different things before committing to LinkedIn? Yes and no. So the the last part of that sentence changes it a little bit of that question. Mm -hmm. So I started with LinkedIn. That's how I started. And and most people who are listening to this who are Twitter fans will probably find that to be an odd choice. But think back to like late 2018 as I had this sort of panic attack and I knew that I was going to go out on my own. The first thing that I thought was I needed some attention. Like I just knew that attention would be a good thing. And so mm. I didn't know how to get any. I'm a sales leader, so I know how to sell myself really well, but I don't actually know how to go out and like do distribution or back then I didn't know how. So one of the guys who worked for me was named Kevin Dorsey and he had been writing on LinkedIn and he was a thought leader in the sales space. And because he was doing that, I was just like, oh, I'll do the same. I'll pick the same platform. Twitter to me was news back then. I didn't understand the platform, right? And I didn't want to be on video or Instagram, you know, so I don't have a six pack abs. So I didn't want to be, you know, throwing, throwing picks up. So I I chose LinkedIn and I I started to, to write. Um, but I also tried like some video, a video series. I tried like long form blog posts. I did all these interesting, like mini webinars, all this stuff to just try and get attention. And then one day I wrote something and it went, it kind of went berserk and it it got like 
I don't know, three or four million impressions. And I was like, oh, this is interesting because A, I like this. I like to write. And and B, like it seems to be working. And so I just, from that moment on, I didn't do video. I don't do audio. I mean, except for, for podcasts and things like this. And I just started writing every single day. And my goal was to be a better writer. And it doesn't matter. Like LinkedIn is just, you're just typing into a box and hitting send. It doesn't matter if it's LinkedIn or Twitter. Like sure, there are different platforms, but the practice of writing every day and shipping and publishing um, was something that allowed me to start understanding how to create as much attention for myself as possible. And so that was, you know, what now two, two and a half, what, three years ago. And, uh, you know, I've been writing every day since. Beautiful. <laughs> so when you first started, because this is like the sticking point for everyone on LinkedIn is one, you, you wanted that attention for the sake of growth and building authority. Mm -hmm. How do you get that initial traction? Yeah, on it's, LinkedIn? it's a great, it's a great question. So uh, first of all, there's an opportunity there, right? So like everyone knows Twitter as the platform for creators, and everyone knows LinkedIn. You and I were, were chatting, you know, before before we hit record about how it's like a resume site. And you're like, oh, I thought it was just a site for resumes or I thought it was just a, a site to share job postings. It is. <laughs> and that's why <laughs> and that's why writing content that's good and compelling on a platform that's not meant to be used that way gives you a leg up. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was all about how can I show up and be radically different than everybody else on this platform? And as I started to look at Twitter and I, I started to pay attention, I was like, oh, I see how people are using Twitter. I'm gonna go use I'm gonna go use LinkedIn just like people use Twitter. And because nobody else was doing that, I stood out. And uh, as I started to stand out, I started to just do things that I had done in my sales leadership job. Analyze the data, what's working, what isn't working, double down on what does, cut what doesn't. And so I started to learn about formatting, right? Um, being compelling, being polarizing. I read every book that I could get my hands on on copywriting. I read all the yeah. cash advertising and Ogilvy on advertising. And I read all Russell Brunson's books on how to create characters. And, you know, I just became a student of getting attention. And I got really good at it. And the interesting thing about getting attention online is that it's addicting. And anyone who says yeah. that it isn't is full of shit. And so once you, once you get it, you want to get more of it and to get more of it, you got to study more. And so that's just sort of been the cycle that I've gone through is writing, analyzing, studying, writing again, repeat. Mm. I did the same thing and I forget about this all the time. Cash advertising that brings back memories because now, now people are promoting like different copywriting books, but man, like cash advertising is good. Like you'll hear people take the stance where like they go against cash advertising, but that, that opened up so much room for other uh, like research, like more connections to be made. And so with that, one, I encourage everyone to go read cash advertising because it'll just lead down so many different avenues. But also what's, what's like the tangible process for getting those first impressions? Because on Twitter, it's like, oh, you just comment under other people's posts or yeah. you tag someone with a value post and they'll retweet it. So how do you go about that? So there's there's basically two really simple ways. One is not too dissimilar from Twitter, which is, um, and I kind of teach this in my course, which is, yeah, being underneath large accounts. And because LinkedIn is is run by Microsoft and therefore antiquated and doesn't roll out very good features, you can't you don't know when I post. Like there's no there's no notification button. You can't set a bell or a ding for my posts. And so um, what I encourage people to do is find three to five of their favorite thought leaders and just write them a message and say, when do you post? I don't want to miss it. And whenever they post in the morning or in the afternoon or whatever, get there first, but get there first with value, much like Twitter, not too, not too um, different than, than Twitter. Add something meaningful underneath their, their, their post. You can grow from 1,000 followers to 10,000 followers just doing that. The second thing is to write, to publish. And I give a framework for, for getting started on LinkedIn. And again, this translates pretty well to Twitter. You know, I'm getting some really good traction on there after having posted now for just five weeks. Um, so my, my framework is I start with the meat and the meat is like, what do you want to teach someone? What is the thing someone should learn from reading this this post on LinkedIn? It's usually the, the numbers that you'll see on a Twitter thread, right? Step one, step two, step three. It's the meat. It's the information you want to you display. 
Um, so I always write the meat first. What's, what's something I want to teach someone today? How to write well, how to build a business, how to build an audience, whatever you want to call it, right? Once I've written the meat, my next thing is how do I actually want to get people to stop and read this? So I write the hook, which is, again, mm. it translates well to Twitter. First line is the scroll stopper for me. It's how do you get people who are scrolling on their phone to stop when they read that very first line? The second line is the validator. Like, okay, I'm validating reading the second line that it was a good idea for me to stop after reading the first, the first line. And the third line is the hook line, which is getting them to click the see more button, which exists on LinkedIn, but does not on Twitter. So if you wanna click see more, I've got you, right? Once you click see more, you're now into the meat. You're now reading the information that's actually valuable. And at the end of the, the post, I like to do a recap and a call to conversation. So much like you'll see Twitter threads giving you a TLDR, like here's all the things you just read in a short summary, I'll do the same thing on LinkedIn. So that way, if people wanna participate in the conversation, they don't have to go back up and reread everything. They can get the short nugget right at the bottom and it's easy for them to participate. And then I'll do a call to conversation. You know, what would you add? Do you agree, disagree? Calling them into the engagement section, pretty, pretty standard. And so if you can follow that format, even as a first time writer, which is just like hook, meet or information, recap, call to conversation, you're gonna grow slowly if you continue to be con consistent. So really being underneath big accounts and then having a good structured uh, you know, uh, process for your writing, I think are the two biggest things you can do early on. Right. I, I, like, what you, I like what you said there about the, the notifications because now you told everyone when you, when you post, so expect more engagement. 7.15 a.m. Central Time every day. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'll be in there as well. So. With, with that, have you changed your process over time? And what I mean by that is from beginner, let's say zero to 10K followers to 10K and beyond, what's your LinkedIn process now? Yeah, now it's just, it's more robust and it's more systematized. So for example, um, I used to sit at my screen and look at a blank you know, white screen and think, what do I want to write today? And that, that's not, that's never uh, very fun. Over time, as I started to realize that I needed uh, ways to ideate rapidly, I created my own system I called it just the content matrix for lack of a cooler or better name. And what I did was I just took all of the topics that I normally like to write about. I listed them on the left-hand side. I took all of my favorite structures, observations, step-by-step -step guides, how-tos, analytical, X versus Y, past versus present, whatever, all these different structures, listicles, whatever. And I kind of just put those across the top. And then once a week on Saturday morning over coffee, when I'm feeling really energized, I got tons of free time, I sit down and I just pair those things up. Topic, structure, pair, pair, pair. The, the idea is to just ideate quickly, 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 quickly. So as soon as I put these two things together, an idea emerges, I write the headline. So I'll write 10 headlines right away. Now I've got at least 10 starting points. And then I'll use tools like, um, I like, I think it's called Typeform. Um, and there's another, there's Hype Fury. And so I'll just start to plug those into those tools and use some of the inspiration and templates that they have to make sure that I'm writing in a way that's formatted correctly. I'll throw it into Hemingway app. Hemingway will tell me if it's grade one, grade two, grade three, my sentence structure's clear, everything's easy to, to read. And then I, I load it back into Hype Fury and I try and create 10 pieces of content sitting down for two hours. And then because I've created 10 pieces of content, I might as well put them everywhere that's relevant. And so not only will I send them to LinkedIn, but using Hype Fury, I'll send them to Twitter. I'll create posts that will go to Instagram and then I'll put them on my, my website. Since most of my followers are from LinkedIn, I sort of use this suction system where what I'm doing is I'll post the blog on LinkedIn to 130,000 followers and 50,000 newsletter subscribers, and I'll share a snippet of the article, and then I'll redirect them to Twitter. And I'll pull my LinkedIn audience to Twitter. They'll start liking the tweet, and then it gets exposed to lots of strangers on Twitter who have no idea who the hell I am. And so I've been using this momentum trick to kind of take my LinkedIn audience, bring them to Twitter and use them to expose my content to people who don't know me. And so that's sort of the system that I follow on a regular basis. That's smart. <laughs> I really yeah, like I just, that. Just went from 4,000 to 22,000 followers in like five weeks. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. Man, I'm missing out on the LinkedIn game. I, I knew I was going to have to double down on it right now. But... Uh, 
no, that that's really that's sweet. And you have a lot of power. I've I've specifically on Twitter, I'm sure it's on LinkedIn too, but you've talked about the amount of impressions you get. And this is all technically organic compared to paid ads. Mm -hmm. What are your views on paid ads? I, I've never run a paid ad. Um, I don't have the competency to like know how to run an advertisement. So uh, I'm not, I don't know how to do that, which may sound really silly to, to people listening, but like, I just don't care. I, I generally believe that I am more likely to make sales of my product by building this massive organic following. By, by having people know exactly what I stand for, exactly what I write about, exactly my, what my opinions are, and exactly what my products help them do. And I make most of my products priced at what I call like an impulse buy pricing. I'm not out there selling $1,200 masterclasses. The amount of trust that it requires to build in order to get someone to spend 1200 bucks is pretty massive. Most of my stuff is what I call trust tripwires, right? So it's getting people in with a lower cost product that delivers incredible value and having them start to say like, this is someone we can trust. When I spend money with Justin, I know that I'm gonna get significant value from the product. And so I feel like the best way to do that is to continue to go out and build an organic following. Could I do advertising and maybe have a three to one return on, on my investment? Maybe, uh, I'm sure there are a million Facebook ad gurus out there who would tell you that that can happen. It's just not something I've done yet. And I'm sure some of your listeners will be like, why not? And the answer is, uh, I just haven't focused on it. I wish I had a, a better answer. No, I'm the I'm same exact way. Like I, I tried a whole Facebook ad agency a while ago, and that was my only experience with ads ever. And after just like seeing, and as you said, getting kind of addicted to the growth on either platforms, it's like, why do I... Like, I don't feel like I really need this, especially right now when this is working and it's mm -hmm. not really worth splitting focus. So I completely agree with you there. But uh, I guess, yeah, paid ads, they're an option. They're there for certainly people like us when we decide to go after them. So no if I decide to build it, yeah, if I, if I decide to build a SaaS platform or a SaaS company, like, mm. and the price is at the right, uh, you know, if I can get enough people into good lifetime value, then sure, I'll spend spend some money and have customer acquisition costs. And if I can justify that, then yeah, hell yeah, I'll, I'll run ads. But someone yeah. else will run them for me because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> exactly. But with all of this, so we talked about content, how you ideate and come up with all of this content. This all falls under the umbrella of a personal brand. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the personal brand, how first, how would you define that? I mean, I don't really think about the, I hate the word personal brand. I used to use it a Same. lot when I, when I started, like I wrote guides on how to build a personal brand. So I called it, um, I think of myself in this, I mean this in the least arrogant way possible. So I don't, I don't mean this in an arrogant way, but I think of myself as a walking business. I don't think of myself as a personal brand. I'm a person who happens to know how to solve a lot of people's challenges. I know how to help people grow their audience on LinkedIn. I know how to help people build their first service business. I know how to help people productize service businesses that they've been successful with. I know how to do those things. And so it's not my personal brand, it's my business. And I think that I have spent the last two years, two and a half years, being really, really afraid or uncomfortable to call myself an entrepreneur. Because to me, entrepreneurs are people who start SaaS companies. That's what I think of when I think of an entrepreneur. Someone who raises $100 million in capital. And for me to call myself that was just so uncomfortable. And recently I had a dinner with the former CEO of the first startup that I was at, which is a unicorn. And he said, well, you know, tell me about what you're doing. And I described it and he said, you're an entrepreneur. That's a business. That's a business that scales. Like you can scale that business year over year. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So for the very first time, two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I started referring to myself as a, an entrepreneur rather than as a personal brand or, you know, a one man business. And I had all those different ways to refer to myself that way other than entrepreneur. And now I feel comfortable saying that. Mm, I can relate to that a lot because it's the same, like, one, there's the stigma that an entrepreneur is someone who builds some form of like huge company. They're very like 
out of touch in a sense. But then there's also mm-hmm. the stigma of like, oh, entrepreneur is a kind of like cheesy way to put it in some cases. Maybe only I've experienced sure. that. But yeah, it's 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 a weird dynamic there. And I want to talk about the, what is it? The, I lost my train of thought, but we'll dive into, yeah, we'll we'll dive into the promotional aspects of Mm -hmm. LinkedIn and personal brand and how you go about this. Because in, in my opinion, like the one man business, it's much more clearly personal. It's much more authentic. Mm -hmm. And with that comes different ways of selling things sometimes, because as a business, it's like, you have to stick to the brand message. You have to stick to this certain way of saying things. So when it comes to promotions there, how do you go about promotions on LinkedIn? Yeah, I think about it. I I forget. I was having a conversation with a guy named Eddie Schlainer who runs uh, a site called verygoodcopy.com. And we were talking about copywriting and he used this one word, something about curtain language. And it was like, you use this language in your copy to infer that there is something magical behind the curtain. And, Mm. you know, the audience needs to pay to pull that curtain back and see what's behind it. And so that's always stuck with me. And so when I go out and I create content, the first thing that I'm doing to set up my promotion is I'm proving expertise. Like if you look at my LinkedIn profile, every single thing that I've written gets a hundred thousand impressions or more. Like I can prove that I know how to build an audience there. The next thing that I can do is I can prove that I've turned it into making money. I can share screenshots of how much money the business makes just based on LinkedIn, how much my products make, all those different things. That is all just setting the table. That's all table stakes for me. Like being an expert, having some authority, showing people that you know what you're doing. But then the next thing that I want to do is I want I want to let my audience know that the way that I do those things is really complex. And I can show you the complex systems that go behind doing those things, but that exists inside my product. So the first thing that I do when I go out to promote something is I create sort of um, a takeaway of what you get with the outcome. So what happens when you have 130,000 LinkedIn followers? Well, you get great job opportunities. You get asked to speak on podcasts like this. You get asked to speak on stage at events like Saster. You make money. You can sell products. You can be a thought leader. You can win awards. All those things can happen if you build a big following. So first I set the table and say like, imagine being able to attain all of these things, right? What's the gap between not having them and having them? growing an audience, becoming an expert and having some authority. Want to do that? Here's a peek behind the curtain. Want to peek behind the curtain fully? Here's how much it costs, right? And then I throw out an impulse buy. My product is $150. Not necessarily as much of an impulse buy as my first product at $50, but with a nice 25 or 30% discount, it becomes something that people can easily pull the trigger on. And whenever people pull the trigger on it, I put them into a a funnel where I ask for video testimonials two weeks later and I have 2,500 students. I've got hundreds of video testimonials that are really, really powerful. They all get automated to my landing page. So my conversion rate continues to increase over time as people visit there. And I just, the cycle continues. People buy, people video promote. I post about it. People go to the site, conversion increases, they buy, they video promote and around and around and around it goes. And so that's how I think about promotion. There's no more complicated system than just that specific sort of flywheel that I've created. That's real. That's amazing. I'm going to pull, I'm going to go back over this. I, (laughs) I encourage people to rewind this and go over that because to me, I've always struggled with that, right? It's always the give value, give value up front, give value as much as you're told, one, both to give value up front in mm-hmm. your free content and even on the landing page, etc. But the being able to not give so much away that makes people want to try to do it on their own, if that mm-hmm. makes sense, because then they're just going to leave totally. or... Uh, And they may come back eventually once they don't have those complex systems. Here's something interesting, though, in in that I, I, um, I had a conversation with someone who has a really massive following, 
on Twitter, and I won't share share who it is, but uh, he, he and I had a chance to get a coffee here in Nashville. And we agreed on something, which is I can take everything in my product today that is in the paid product. And I, if you look at it, it has all been shared for free somewhere. Somewhere right. along the line, I have shared everything that exists inside of it. People don't pay me for some new secret, even though they believe they are. They believe they're paying for new, what they're really paying for is aggregation. They're paying for everything in one spot. They're paying to go from point A to point B in one hour, not to have to sift through my content for the last two years and spend a month trying to put it all together. And so I always give freely. Every system I figure out, everything I described about siphoning my LinkedIn audience, and bring, that's all free. You can all read that on my, on my website. But when you want to go build your first LinkedIn audience, you want to go build your first service business, I've assembled all of that information in a way that is extremely digestible and affordable. And so people pull the trigger, get a lot of value, and continue to buy from me. Um, one, one thing, Dan, that I didn't mention that might be helpful to some people is outside of creating that flywheel, at the end, there's also an invitation to join my private community. And I make my private community subscriptions quarterly, so they're impulse buys again. So people can just join the community, they come in, 99 bucks for a quarter. And what I'm creating is my own personal Twitter, my own personal LinkedIn, where as I grow and as I sell more and create more products, now I can promote them on Twitter, I can promote them on LinkedIn through my newsletter, but I can also go to 2,000 people who I have as a captive audience who enjoy my, my stuff and drop a link in a Slack channel. That's yep. pretty, like, that's, the, that's an easy way to continue to sell future products from people who are already excited. And so it's all these different sort of buckets of, you know, it's kind of a diversified portfolio of income, if you will, in, in, in distribution. Yeah, I love that. I love how you put that. And the, the one question I have from that is why, why the quarterly? Have you tried the monthly pricing structure? I haven't. Um, I started yearly and mm. what I found is that yearly really, really screws with your optionality. So like three months in, if you don't like running the community, you got nine more months, right? <laughs> right? And so for me, I brought it down to quarterly, mostly because I don't want it to be a hotel. Like I want people who want to come in and stay for a while. And so I think if you give the community 90 days, you're probably going to be really, really pleased with it. I think if you come in for like 14 days and you're like, ah, I don't like this in the first 14, I'm not going to spend the last 14. And then you'll probably have a higher churn rate. I could test it out to see what works, but quarterly gives me the right amount of sort of oomph to get the right people in, but it also gives me optionality where I'm always three months away from, if I don't like it anymore, closing up shop. That makes a lot of sense. I like that. I may try that myself. And so I regained my train of thought from when I lost it. And my question here is, I've been toying with this in my head a lot. And it is like the future of business kind of as a whole. But where do you, since you are a one-man operation or a one-man mm -hmm. business and, and you see the value in that, do you see things moving more towards that? I don't know that I see things moving more towards that. I, I think I see, and, and I'll say I'll say something about a topic that I know very little about. I'm not a Web3 NFT crypto guy. I'm just not. It's just not something that I understand very well. But like I do see like DAOs, DAOs, whatever you, you call them. And, and I, I don't think that's all that different than what one man or one, one woman businesses will do in the future. You know, for example, if you look across Twitter, I see a lot of people building product studios. So they're studios that create product nonstop and they rely on people with heavy distribution to go out and deploy those products to their audience. That's a product studio. I want to create a distribution studio. Myself, other people who have really large followings, why can't we bundle together and say, hey, you want to take a SaaS platform to market? Hey, you want to take an info product to market? Mm -hmm. You want to take a community to market? Collectively, we do 500 million impressions every year. Like, what's that worth to you? What, what are you willing to give away for that? Wow. And I think that if one man and one woman businesses pair together to, to really improve their power, then they can start to own a large percentage or, or even a small percentage of a lot of businesses. And I think that's a really powerful thing. That is. I have to munch on that as well because I, I can't talk too much about this, but like I, I just love, uh, I, I feel like it is a very big thing and very accomplishable for those people that are driven to do it, right? To escape whatever 
suffering they're in in terms of a job or something else because that's that's what a lot of the people that interact with us and buy our products they want to do but then i kind of get caught up in that mindset of like oh everyone wants to do this or this is where things are going to move or there's going to be a massive push when in reality i don't really know all i can do is just keep pushing the message i'm pushing yeah and and i think what people often overlook is so imagine me right when when i when i quit patient pop built the company from a sales organization perspective to 50 million from zero right mm -hmm. And I could have gone out and said, well, look at guys like Mark Roberge who built HubSpot. He built that to 100 million from zero. Therefore, I am not the expert. Mark is the expert <laughs> because he did something twice. As That'd be foolish because there's a lot of people struggling to build something to a million bucks. So the reason that I'm telling you the story is there's probably a lot of people who listen, who want to do something on their own, want to leave their nine to five, want to get started in self-employment, who look at other people and say, there's already a me out there, but there isn't. Like... There's a million guys talking about audience building, building businesses, building on LinkedIn. There's a million of me, right? But all I want is for people, I'm the brand, I'm the niche. The niche is me. And when the niche is me, I don't compete with anyone else. And so I'm always trying to teach people to like build a niche of one. Build something where people like you because you're entertaining, humorous, funny, polarizing. Be the guy or the girl that people want to follow. There's, as long as you're interesting, there can only be one of you. And if you can build that niche of one, you get, you know, Kevin Kelly, thousand true fans, whatever it is, like you got a walking business there. And so I just hope people don't get discouraged by seeing that more people are dipping their toe in the water because it's just validation. It's not, it's yes. not competition. Completely agree. It, it means it's working and it means there's something there. Mm -hmm. And the way that I like to put it, because that's a, this is a big thing I talk about a lot in terms of like you being your own niche and I am a big spiritual guy, so I, I try to, and like philosophical, so I spin it in the way of like your conditioning, every single uh, stimuli, external stimuli you've been exposed to, your personality, the things that have built up over time makes it so nobody can compete with you if mm -hmm. you learn specific skills to market and sell yourself on the internet and understand those hard skills of content creation, writing, marketing, sales, et cetera. So with that, we talked about that one huge misconception with online business as a whole. What are other common misconceptions that people have when they come to you, when it's time to build <clears throat> something for themselves? Yeah, that's a really great question. I, I think the, the most common misconception is that if you have an appropriate niche and a product that solves a specific groups, uh, group of people's problems that you're sort of all set. I think like, oh, I work with um, high performance female sales leaders in the healthcare technology space. I help them become better at their, their jobs. Okay, cool. I've identified my niche and I'm really good at that. I did that thing for five years and I know how to do that thing. Knowing the people whose problem you solve and being able to solve their problems are, are only two pieces of the pie. The other piece of the pie that you're forgetting is getting that attention we talked about earlier, is mm -hmm. getting those eyeballs, making sure that people know who you are, what you do, and why you do it. And so the, the misconception that I see is that people don't spend enough time or don't understand the amount of time you have to spend copywriting, learning how to be a great podcast host, learning how to host live events on, on video, if that's your medium, like running a successful YouTube channel, building an Instagram following. It doesn't matter if you know how to solve a problem. Like if people don't know about yeah. you, it's all a moot point. And so to me, one person businesses are mostly about marketing. And I think that gets greatly overlooked by a lot of people going into them. That was so well put. I, I wish I could put it like that. Well, now I can. Wow. Because I made that, I unconsciously made that comparison because we talked about what you, the things you tried and failed at before mm -hmm. going all in on LinkedIn. And for me, it was, it was so many different things. And I didn't realize that the problem there was getting my offer in front of people. Because as a freelancer, the five different things I tried freelancing with, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to send 10, 20 cold emails. 
and then get discouraged, call it a day and try something else because it's not working. I could have like get people the greatest results, but if I can't actually get them the results that it doesn't matter. So mm-hmm. that is, that is huge. And a big thing, like one thing I'm big on because once I started learning the marketing, once I picked up cash advertising, once I let that take me down a huge rabbit hole of marketing and sales, it's like everything started to click. It's like, yes, I, I understand like I can solve this problem. I've acquired enough skill to do something for a specific person. And now it's like, okay, how do I make this appealing for that person? How do I actually get their attention in without knowing all of this stuff? What seems like a saturated market? As we talked about before, that's not really the case. So that's huge. And listeners, that is very big so pay attention to the whole marketing side of things and marketing yourself and one thing i do want to talk about as well is your your bios there is a very Mm -hmm. minor difference in your twitter bio and your linkedin bio Mm -hmm. one says you are building a portfolio of one person businesses to five million in revenue that's your linkedin bio your twitter bio is you're building a portfolio of no code businesses to 5 million. What's mm-hmm. what's the reasoning behind that? Yeah, it's a, a good observation. Um it's the best way to put this. So generally Twitter tends to be really tech heavy. So when mm-hmm. I say tech heavy, like LinkedIn has a lot of people who work in technology that is different than people who make a living creating technology. There's two, that's a minor difference there. No code on LinkedIn is not a popular topic. Like people aren't talking about no code. Like they talk about it on Twitter. It's not talked about. Mm. It's not, there aren't as many solopreneurs on, 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 on LinkedIn. There are people who work for other companies. So using the word no code, it's meaningless or, or less meaningful on a platform like, like LinkedIn. One man business That resonates. It's pretty easy. It's easy to understand what it is. I'm a solopreneur, right? Twitter, very focused, very tech heavy in the way that people are building with technology. And so when I talk about building a business, I want to be very clear that I'm not an engineer. I don't uh, build SaaS products. I build everything with no code and mostly service businesses that get productized eventually. That's mostly what I build. Service business until it's good enough, I understand it well enough, I productize it, uh, and then I move on and build another service business, I productize it. That is sort of how I do do business. And I wanna make a clear sort of distinction on each social media platform so that it resonates with the common user. So that's why I think about that. Nice, I like that. So what's, in terms of like the, the similarity there, Mm-hmm. Would you, or are you <clears throat> making one man business and no code business kind of synonymous with each other in your eyes? I don't, I don't know that I am. I, I think it's a good question. I don't know. I don't think so. I think that no code businesses can have lots of employees. And I think a one man mm-hmm. business can be, you know, can, can be someone coding something back, back, you know, building piece of software. Um, for me, it's just using jargon or lingo that is synonymous with that platform. And so that that's yeah. sort of how, how I chose that. Um, I think if I started using the word no code on LinkedIn, people would say, what does that mean exactly? And, and we've been following you for three years. Like, have you changed? Are you doing something different? Um, but building a business is pretty simple to understand. A lot of those p- folks who follow me on LinkedIn, and by the way, I'm painting with a very broad brush here. This doesn't describe uh, everyone, but are, are you know, sales development reps, account executives, you know, they've worked at SaaS companies, but they don't spend time looking at no code tools. They've never used Zapier before. They don't use Notion. It's a very, very different audience. Whereas Twitter, like everyone talks about that, at least everyone that's in my, uh, you know, sort of uh, feed. So it becomes something where I can blend in, but also distinguish myself and say, I am an entrepreneur. I do build businesses, but these are the kind of businesses that I build. And therefore someone doesn't mistake me for, you know, the the next uh, great SaaS builder. Although nice. I may someday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it, man. So the let's go back into like in terms of like breaking apart the bio, what you're helping people with, right? So the mm-hmm. the first step for an absolute beginner 
what is the first thing they should do to start transitioning? What's what's their what do you recommend as their first stream of income to build? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think there's something to think about before you build your first stream of income. I think the first mm-hmm. thing that I, I recommend people think about is like, who do they like to spend time with? Because in my opinion, misery doesn't scale. So if you're spending a lot of time talking to people that you hate talking to, that does not scale. So like, who do you like to spend time with? Okay. Whatever that, whoever that group of people is or are, um, it should be a group of, of people that are behind you in their journey. So if you're, I'll use sales as an example. If you're a sales manager, talking to account executives, they've never managed people before. They're two years behind you in their journey and they want to le- they want to learn how to become a sales manager, right? So that is an example of looking behind you. Where were you two years ago? Where were you three years ago? That's a group of people that hopefully you enjoy talking to. If you do, the next thing that you should do is you should talk to them and you should understand their problems, right? Talk to them for free. Ask them to jump on a call for 15 minutes. What's keeping you from moving to, from an account executive into a sales manager? Again, just kind of using my, my past. Once you understand those challenges, you can very easily create solutions or hypothesize solutions, right? I think this is the way to solve that problem. Or I know very specifically that this is a way to solve that problem. Once you do that, the thing I recommend doing is creating a service business. I'm a big fan of service before product. And because I think you learn so much for your product, by first having a service business. So for me, that service business often looks like a simple coaching business. Okay, great. I'm gonna go find 20 account executives who wanna be sales managers. I'm gonna make it a no-brainer impulse buy price. Come spend an hour with me for a hundred bucks. Okay, mm. cool. You just made 2000 bucks talking to 20 people and you can start to identify commonalities. Okay, what are the most common challenges these people have? Yeah, they all have five challenges, but what's the most common one? What's the biggest one? What's the most painful one? cool, how do I solve that very specific challenge? You work through it with those 20 people, you're gonna start to see common solutions. Oh, each time I do this one particular thing with all of these 20 people, it works, right? So what does that become? That becomes your product. So then you go build a product. You know, how to become a sales manager in three months at your job, right? Go from point A to point B in 90 days. Put that into a product, deliver that product into your audience, and now you can raise your service rates. So instead of $100 for an hour, now you're $250 an hour. Someone can't afford your rates, you point them to the product. Someone doesn't wanna learn the self-guided product, you point them to your rates. And that's just how you build your first two revenue streams. Then you can repeat that, right? You can do that with another group of people you like helping. The, the potential is limitless. And by the time you're done, you've got five products. They're all impulse buys. You can point people to them on your content, on your email list, or ever when they reach out to you one-on-one, you say, go over there, buy that product. And you also have five different service offerings that you have at hopefully a higher ticket price. So that's how I think about sort of the, going from who do you wanna work with to building a service business to productizing the knowledge that you learn by working with those people. Beautiful. That's exactly what almost everyone I've talked to has done, but it's never been put that simply. And I've, I've been growing, like originally I was, I went the freelancer route, freelancer route, right? Which I still think is extremely viable, but I like the consulting route much, much, Mm -hmm. much more. Like that's what I eventually transitioned into after I, I started with web design, realized that I was kind of a commodity, had to learn more skills, start with funnels, make it specific to a specific business. And then once I had results there, I could start consulting people on it, especially the people I liked being around, which were creators, other one man businesses, because they're, they're just fun to talk to. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I could consult them on these things and they like doing them things on their own, that's one thing I've noticed about myself. It's like, I like to do things on my own rather than having someone do it for me. I would rather learn from them, pay them to teach me and then do it myself from a better point of view. So a a lot of different avenues there, but I completely agree with the service business. So we're closing in on time and I have one last question for you. Mm -hmm. And this can be pertaining to anything, business, life, whatever. What is the most potent piece of advice that you agree with but you feel like other people skip over? Wow, that's a really good question. 
Um, here's what I think it is. So I'm a big fan of small risk. And so a lot of people talk about like, don't have a plan B, right? Mm. Or, or go all in on one thing. And if you don't go all in on one thing, you're not committed. I don't like know it. if this is ex- exactly, <laughs> but I disagree with that. So like yeah. my, my thing is I love to spread risk out. This, I like to invest in my businesses in the same way that I invest my money, which is diversified. And therefore, you know, if something happens to one of them, I'm not shit out of luck. And I think the majority of stuff I read out there is like, go hard or go home, go deep, no plan B. If you put all your energy towards one thing, you have the most chances for success. I disagree with all of that. For me, it's like, I'd rather build 10 $50,000 businesses than one $500,000 business. And that advice is comes off the back of people like Daniel Vasallo, who talk a lot about that on Twitter. I'm, I'm a big fan of the way that he thinks about small bets. And so that is the most profound piece of advice that I've received is, is basically reading some of his earlier Twitter stuff as he was discovering that for himself. Nice. I completely agree there. So I do talk about like going all in, but it's, it's nuanced in a case where like, I feel like the majority of the things you do should be diversified. But then when there is that pull to say like go monk mode on one project or something similar that's when you go all in in my opinion you need to focus in on that one thing but i love that because i've been opening up or making connections regarding those small risks a lot more and i've been writing about it a good amount which helps a lot with understanding it so justin that was an absolutely amazing podcast. That was, <laughs> There were some great pieces of advice dropped there. So I appreciate you for coming on. The last thing, where can people find you? And then where can people purchase your products? Yep. You can find me on Twitter at Justin Sass. That's Justin S-A-A-S. Uh, you can find me on my website at justinwelsh.me. Or you can find, if you're interested in learning how to grow on LinkedIn, which I'm sure a lot of Twitter folks aren't, but if you are, um, you can go to theoperatingsystem.co, theoperatingsystem.co. Sweet. And we'll have all of those in the description. And I, I guarantee a lot of Twitter people want to grow on LinkedIn. <laughs> I feel like they they're should. just choosing. Yeah, they should. They're, they're choosing the polarizing option where it's like, fuck LinkedIn. Twitter's the only way. So, no. We're all going to cool. take over LinkedIn. <laughs> Great interview. Yes. Thank you, man. Thanks for coming on again. We'll see Appreciate you next it. time. See you. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of the Modern Mastery Podcast. I have a few favors to ask you. For a whopping $0, you can support this podcast by following, rating, and subscribing on whichever platform you are listening on. For an additional $0, you can share this podcast and tag us at Modern Mastery on Twitter or at Modern Mastery HQ on Instagram. This helps the Modern Mastery community grow and allows me to bring you top tier guests to fuel your hunger for wisdom. It costs zero dollars, but it does cost you your time and we understand how valuable that can be. Lastly, if you are trying to build a one person business as a content creator, coach, freelancer, digital product creator, or online educator, consider joining Modern Mastery HQ that has hundreds of proven processes, strategies, and systems that you can copy and paste into your life and business to become a highly paid, free, and fulfilled individual. Go to join.modernmastery.co slash podcast to get your first month for $5 and gain instant access to four beginner legacy courses, hundreds of trainings and strategies, and a community of growth-minded individuals because quite frankly, your friends and family just don't understand this kind of stuff. With that, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Modern Mastery Podcast, and I'll see you in the next one.